But tonight, chapter three, transmission basics and networking media. Transmission basics, how do we get this information from one point to the other? What was the OSI model? What was it a model of? Now the data is transmitted. Once it gets into the stack, once, once the computer communicates with its end of the OSI model, how it gets all of that header information, and when you got below the data, all of those layers put headers on the data. The objective is to get it from point A to point B to a specific computer. And that, that's the whole objective of this thing. What we've got really is a whole lot, to me, a whole lot of overhead, a whole lot of management in order to get this little bitty thing to a remote site. It's kind of like mailing a letter, isn't it, Stephanie? Yes. How is it like mailing a letter? All, all of that addressing information. What happens when you, you mail a letter, you go to the post office, right? Yeah, That's the service, and you put it in the mailbox. And it goes through the... Then they come out, and they take it out of the mailbox, right? Yep. And then they go in, and what do they do with it? They sort it. They so sort it. And then they put it in different boxes, right, these things. And then they take it to someplace else, put it on a truck, put it on an airplane, put it on anything else. And when it gets to the other end, it is the same thing all over again. What happens to this data? I know we haven't got, see, we haven't got to the objectives yet. What happens to this data? You go to www.yahoo.com. What happens to this data? We go through all of that addressing information, and that's a big part of what we're going to do in this course is how do we get that information from point A to point B. So the objectives for tonight explain basic transmission concepts, including full duplex and attenuation and noise. And again, lots of terminology in this one. Lots of terminology in this one. We're going to help you on your quizzes. Still on. Not now. Yes, it is. I'm looking at it. That's what you're doing. No, please don't, because I got my work up here. I'll leave it alone. These different terminologies, and again, the, there is a lot of terminology in this chapter. There's a little bit of conceptual material, but lots of terminology. The physical characteristics of coaxial cable. Shielded twisted pair, unshielded twisted pair, and fiber optic media, and that's what all this stuff up here is primarily, are those things. The benefits and limitations of different networking media. What would you use in different circumstances? What's vulnerable to different atmospheric, atmospheric conditions? How much does different ones cost? What does it cost to manufacture? What does it cost to install it? Why would you use different kinds of material? And I don't know that they ask those questions, but those are kind of some of the things that, that they go through in, in these kinds of, of things. Best practices for cabling buildings and work areas, and there are standards. Each of these things has a standard. The definition, the set of rules, the, the, uh, the, the cabling for buildings is a, is a standard. Making the wire is a standard. Building the fiber optic cable is a standard. So all of those things have standards that we need to be need to meet in order to be able to do those things. Specify the characteristics of popular wireless methods, the 802.11 infrared and Bluetooth. 802.11 obviously is the most popular uh, of the wireless standards, and that's what most everything uses, is it not? Mm -hmm. We have some infrared. There are some things are infrared, and the questions you see, like somebody is syncing a wireless device and they got to be at least three feet, three feet or less away. Well, the answer to that's infrared, obviously. Bluetooth, Bluetooth is not a, an 11 standard, but it uses the same frequency as the 11s. It uses the, the 2.4 gigahertz, so it's part of that mix. And how far does it say Bluetooth will go? 30 feet. 30 feet. I can set it upstairs. I was over in room 104 today and I was talking to myself through this. 
with the with the antenna in this room. So depends on the atmospherics, depends on the, the atmospheric conditions, depends on what's between you and it. All of these 30 feet, 100 feet, 100 meters, 200 meters are with no impedance. If you put walls up, it's going to slow down, things down. If you put steel walls up, it's probably going to stop things. If you put windows in there, that's probably not going to be an issue. The electromagnetic, the 802.11s will go through the walls. They get uh, reduced in signal strength as they go through there. Infrared's not going to go through those. And, infra and Bluetooth, Bluetooth devices is not going to go as far because the Bluetooth devices, the headsets are not as big, can't have as much power, not as big a battery, not as big an antenna can go in those things, so they're not going to go as far. Oh, Bluetooth, they're awesome. Yeah, well, there's lots of things used as Bluetooth. It's not just headsets. Yeah, it can be used for actually listening to music. You can do, you can do a lot of stuff with Bluetooth. But what is Bluetooth? It's just a wireless device. A wireless device. What is Bluetooth? It's a really cool it's name, right? It's a standard. It's a day the data is encoded. It's a standard. That allows these devices to connect together. Well, I have a little video when you get to security it will show you why. Show you how to hack Bluetooth. Guy's standing, guy's standing outside of a Starbucks and he gets into a guy's headset. Plays music for him, listens to his order, talks to him. Are you serious? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's also illegal. That's awesome. Well, why a passcode? What's, what is most of the passcodes? That's the problem. Zero, zero, zero. zero, zero, zero. Most everything is a zero, zero, zero. If it's a zero, 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 why well, have one? Because maybe you can create your own. I think you can change them, but you do those things. And it's an yeah. Transmit in, in data network, and transmit means to issue signals to send something to the network medium. So we're going to transmit, and we're going to receive NICs. NICs are what are called transceivers. What's a transceiver? It transmits and receives. It's transmitter receiver. So what these things do is take the digital signals from the computer, they get them through the bus on the computer and, and transform them into a signal that can go on the media, whichever type media, and we'll get to those in a few minutes, whichever type of media that we, we use. We could use a wireless media, a wired media, copper media, or a light media, the, uh, the fiber. So we're going to transmit, and if we transmit, you hope somebody's out there to receive. So that's the other thing we're going to do with these things, transmit the stream. Transmission refers to either the process of transmitting or the progress of signals after they've been transmitted. Transmission, how fast does the data go? How, how good is our transmission in these things? And in these transmissions, we have analog and digital devices. We all want to live in the digital world. Is anything analog? Is anything analog anymore? I'm analog. I am too. Digital. Really? I'll bet you're analog. There. What about music? Analog. Yeah. That is true. What about a television screen? It, it can be analog or digital. Now, the music itself... Is analog. Well, there is some digital. Yeah. 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 The, the little, you know... Nobody is home now. That's the digital. Can you say that again for no. the fun of it? No. Crowd pleaser. But, yeah, crowd pleaser. The, uh, but those are the digital. Like digital is like just being said. Yeah, did you, ever, did you ever turn Windows on and have it read to you? Yes. <laughs> That's digital. Yeah, you kind of got annoying because I didn't know how to shut it off. That's up. digital. Yeah, but it's, it's not very pleasing. It has no intonations has no emphasis, has no really identifiable voice, does it? Tenny. 
digital voices. So yes, there are digital voices, but typically we prefer analog. You ever uh, read a sentence, look good, and then you go back to it, and it's boy, it's got a lot of errors in it. Yeah. Your eye and your mind fixes it for you. Mm -hmm. Why does it do that? Because it doesn't pick up at first what you're reading. Cause you, it's processed. Why? Well, if it was digital, it certainly would, wouldn't it? Not really, because whatever. really, it wouldn't. No. Do computers make mistakes? Yeah, because you're the when? putting this stuff in the computer. No, 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 that's not the question I ask. I didn't ask if there were programming errors. I ask if computers make mistakes. Nope. They do that. exactly what they say. Programming errors are the, are the human mistakes. Okay. I kind of get that. But uh, the computers themselves, they do occasionally, but they rarely make mistakes with a, with a power fluctuation or something like that. <laughs> they might. But analog, digital. And what's the difference in these signals? It's a lot of difference, actually. Okay, what? A lot of difference. Kinda. Kinda? Uh, there are a lot of differences. What are, what are the differences? It varies, like, the different signal strength is very Different different. signal strength. Signal into, strength's really not... Like, it can run into problems. Like run into problems. What does analog signal mean when we say analog signal? Mm -hmm. What's an analog signal? That's exactly. Voltage varies continuously, constantly changing. It's the wavy line. Wavy line. We always draw these really cool sinusoidal waveforms. That's not exactly the way it that's works, but that's the way we're going to do it. Hurt. Huh? That's when you got hurt to break with the we'll get to those. What does a digital signal look like? Square. Well, yeah, we always draw it square. What it really looks like is something like this, because you have capacitance in here, you have a resistance to the charge. They're really not instantaneous changes, although we'd like to. So digital would be something like this, right? Yeah. On or off. So how do we make music come out on CDs? Because CDs are digital, right? Yeah, that's because you're, it's pretty much repeating what Ian said, but... It is? That's as you play that backwards, right? Digital analog, oh, I can do that. Digital analog converter. Did you ever convert anything, a record, for instance, yes. to a CD? Yes. What did you have to do? You have to like plug up. I know you had to plug up all that other stuff. What did you have to pick? The encoding format. The encoding format. You had to do that. What else? How about sample rate? What does sample rate do for you? We have this analog, because what we want to do is try to replicate, reproduce an analog event. True? Depending on the sample, if you picked a high sample rate, what happened to your file? Got really big. If you had a low sample rate, what happened to your file? Really smaller, but what happened to the quality of it? Yeah, it's like I was talking a while ago, right? <laughs> I like yours better. But like so, what sample rate? It's how many digital samples that we would take on this thing per unit time to take this analog signal and represent it in a digital or a binary format. We'll talk about binary conversions here in a few minutes and how could we do that because this would all represent voltage levels, ones and zeros. If we took, let's go over here, samples like that, the one that has the fewer samples is not going to be very high quality. It's not going to be high at all. It's not going to really represent what goes on. And the different digital formats of the things that you play, the voice formats, all, all of them have sample rates, different quality of what goes on. Analog signals, as Stephanie said, the voltage varies constantly, continuously, and appears as a wavy line. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's a real technical explanation, isn't it, wavy line? Yeah. We'll get, to, we'll get to those. The wave's amplitude is a measure of its strength. And when you talk about voltage, the amplitude, the larger the amplitude, 
And if we graph this thing, if we started at zero and went to maybe five volts, the amplitude on this would be five volts because we go from zero to five volts. And come back down. And, and if it were properly done, if it was a true sinusoid, let's make this one go a little deeper here, it would go to a minus five volts. So the total change would be 10 volts from a minus five to a plus five as we do those things. Frequency is the number of times the amplitude cycles start from a point and go through the highest one. So what it really means is it was, we start at a point, go to the maximum amplitude, go back through the zero point to the minimum amplitude, and then back to the zero. So that would be one complete cycle. She wants to get into hertz, so we'll get into hertz. A hertz is one cycle per second. Hertz was named after a German when I first started electronics. We used to use cycles per second. Then sometimes when I was in college, they started calling it Hertz. And he's, he did a lot. He did a lot of work in that area, and they named it after him. So we go through these things measured in Hertz. Hertz is really pretty slow, and. 60 hertz, 60 cycles per second, that's what the electricity runs at. When we talk about <coughs> sending data on the network, we talk in megahertz or megas, megabits, and we're really going to have megahertz in order to do those things. Because to be able to send some information, what do you got to have? What if we had a one hertz what if we had a one hertz here? What if we had just a one cycle and it stopped? How much information could we send? One bit. What if I change it one time? How much information can I send? So we're going to have to have some changes. The more changes, the, the higher the frequency, the more data we can send. If I were sending Morse code, which I'm not, I'll, I'll drive you crazy with those, right? Flashing that on and off. But you can, the frequency is something that you have to take into consideration when you do these things, too. Here's my little frequency chart. So you can see that it's got, this one is 0.5 hertz, 1 hertz, 2 hertz. This one's not. Not going so fast, is it? The 0.5 hertz? I wish it wouldn't do that at the end, but it is. 2 hertz, it's going twice as fast as the 1 hertz, which is going twice as fast as the 0.5 hertz, right? How many cycles does it go through per second? How many total changes on and off all the, through the whole cycle? Different frequencies, the wavy lines. See, these really are wavy, Stephanie. The wavy lines. We have different different frequencies here, though, don't we? Yeah. Because the frequency is what? The wave, though. Um, the complete cycle, right? From zero to the maximum through mm -hmm. the neutral point again to the minimum and back to the neutral point. Wavelength is a distance corresponding to points on the wave cycle. The wavelength is a measure bet between the zero points. How much time, and the wavelength, wavelength and frequency are related. Because the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. The lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. So they're inver inversely related. Phase is the progress, this is one I love, progress of the wave over time is a fixed point. What does that mean? And why do we care about this anyway? Because you have to. Why? Because it's the way the process Because it's goes. the way the process goes. We can do some things with this that we'll get into in a few minutes. But phase means that we start this one at time zero. We have a second set of information that goes at a later time same shape, but it is shifted. 
the phase is the difference between the start times, basically, between these two uh, these two signals. And if we do that, when we do that, we can put different information on each of these starting points, different different information, different phase. The frequency is going to be there. And what we eventually want to do is put intelligence on these things, right? When we say intelligence, we mean information or data, not necessarily smart, but information to go across these things. Analog transmissions are susceptible both to transmission flaws such as noise. True. Is that true? Yes. Does anybody other than me listen to AM radio ever anymore? Unless it's traffic reports, what happens when you go under a power line with AM radio? <laughs> what about lightning? I mean, you can hear a storm coming a long way off with AM, can't you? Yeah. I've heard it. You've heard it. Analog is susceptible to noises. We, I drove this nice, smooth curve. That's really good, right? Is it really that way? Mm -hmm. Nah. And they probably got a much better picture in the book, but at least mine can kind of be entertaining. What we're really talking about is something like this. All sorts of noises on these things. And then, and then we get into what kind of things are we using. Would this affect digital? Not as much, and maybe is a better answer, because could we get noise on these things? And we'll have some pictures here in a minute. It would be really harder to do it than it would. Yeah, be. but the advantage to digital over analog is, how do you figure out what's noise on the analog signal? You can't hear it as much. You can't hear it as much, but how do you figure out what's noise and what's signal? It's kind of jagged in itself, absolutely, because you can't really get them completely clean. What about this thing? If we have a certain voltage level that represents this signal, we can clean that sucker back up by just chopping the top off. So you can clean up the, the digital signal better than you can clean up the analog signal. Now, some analog signals are going to be able to. We're going to get into modulation here in a minute, amplitude modulation, which is what I've shown here, and frequency modulation. If we use frequency modulation and we get noise on the top of it, again, you can just shut it off, cut, chop it off, because you don't really care about how high it goes. You, want, you care about how much it changes, how many times per second it changes with the, uh, with the frequency modulation keep losing this clicker. You need to like Velcro too. Digital signals are composed of pulses of precise yeah. voltages and zero voltages. A positive voltage represents a one, a zero voltage represents a zero. Like so off. it's like on and off. But what kind of information do computers read? Binary. Ones and zeros, binary. Let's say ones and zeros because it may use hexadecimal, may use octal. There's lots of different numbering systems that it can use, but it's they're all represented by binary bits. So if we represented something, we might have an on, an off, an on. and an off. Does that mean something? Sure. What is it? A one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one. I'm counting eight because we do, in, do it in bytes, right? And Chris is going to add it up for me, right? Yeah. Huh? One, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixteen. Huh? We're going to get there. You're going to be very proficient at this. So aren't you glad you got? Did, aren't you glad you studied in that math class now? Really, you're trying to trick me with numbers again? This is not. Well, we only have to count to two. Yay! And we only have to multiply by two. That's pretty simple, right? Even I can multiply by two in my head most of the time. Can I 
the until I get up to about 4098, 4092, whatever it is. What? We'll get there. Wavelengths, again, just again, lots of pictures, lots of repetition on these things because there's lots of, there is a lot of terminology in this chapter. We've got two days for this chapter we're going to spend, and on, the, on Wednesday we'll finish up what's left after tonight, and then we're going to make some wire get into the wire standard, the, the twisted pair wire standard. The, they, they in, the, in the test bank at least, hit those standards pretty heavily, the, the twisted pair standard. So wavelength is a measure from peak to peak or, or, or minimum to minimum. It's, it's from one point to the other, the total, a complete path from one point to the other. Digital and analog is compared. This is kind of something I found on the internet. We take the digital source plus EMI, EMI, electromagnetic interference, noise. What causes electromagnetic interference? Uh, light. Fluorescent lights are really bad about it. About anything. About anything. What about microwave ovens? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the more bigger what about cordless portable cordless telephones? We get it at home. We can always tell when we're going to get a call. Because we use cell phones. I can tell when we're going to get a telephone call because I hear it in the speakers on the television before it gets to the telephone. Is it noise? Yep, goes goes through the speakers on the television. So we have these things, and, and we had we draw these, and mine are not nice pure numbers, but realistically, if you look at this one, we've got. The EMI, we're always going to have some noise on these signals. Digital is easier to clean up. This is this is an analog output. This is one. This is actually an analog output with no intelligence on it, because it's just a constant changing signal. That would be a carrier signal, a tone, a carrier signal. A carrier signal. Why do we need a carrier signal? What radio station do you listen to? Ninety-six three R. Ninety-six three. Guess what the carrier frequency is? 96.3. You've got to have something to tune to, the carrier, and then you put the intelligence on top of the carrier signal. Then make it produce it out. Huh? Is it any way, shape, or form that that represents how many watts they transmit? No, the power is different. What, that's just the, the frequency is just in the frequency spectrum. It's the middle, it's the middle frequency and then they have a certain bandwidth that they go around. Uh, the power is just how strong the signal is. How, hmm? how strong it is, which basically implies how far it can go. Uh, AM, we've got these, what, 50,000 watt stations? I think WSM in Nashville is 50,000 watts. You can listen for it, to it from Nashville to up around uh, Pennsylvania. I used to drive that from Nashville to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and I could get it except for in parts of West Virginia where the mountain's gone away. I could listen to WSM almost the whole way. At night. At night. You get different atmospherics at night. The ionosphere changes and it creates, uh, it traps the signals in there and sends them much further. Yep. You don't have interference from the sun. We used to get in the Persian Gulf and Robert never got to go to sea in the Persian Gulf, but we'd be out there. We'd be setting up around Bahrain, and we could see traffic coming through the Strait of Hormuz. That's probably, what, a good 250, 300 miles away? I know you were way up north. You weren't paying any attention to those. Probably a couple hundred. We were getting on the surface on a 30-mile radar. We were getting a couple hundred miles because you get in this atmospheric traps, and the signal goes a long way. Same thing happens on wireless signals, wireless network signals. Are they going to be absolutely consistent all the time? Some of that's going to change with atmospherics. They're not going to be as severe as the things that I've been talking about, but they are going to happen. How far can the signal go? What, what does the signal do for us? Phase, a much better picture of phase here starting at different times. And it, the phase, what we can do with the phase, what if we put one set of intelligence here on the red line and a different set of intelligence here on the blue line. 
then we're going to be sending two sets of information. We're getting a two for one, aren't we getting a two for here? We're sending information on both of these in order to get it from point A to point B. Theta here is the phase difference. The difference between when they come across the zero line, the difference in time here would be would be the uh, the phase difference of these things. Binary conversion, we'll look at this and then we'll take a break because Stephanie wanted to know how we did this. And this is a it's gonna be a really big deal in the next class because you're gonna do these on your fingers. Oh sure. It's a lot easier, it's a lot quicker to do it on your fingers, huh? All right, no, we don't need your toes. We only go to eight. We only go to eight. In the numbering system, let's go back to the numbering system of Wii U, you know, like twelve dollars and sixty three cents. What about it? How does that actually work in the number system? I don't know. It's based on tens, right? First we have sets of one, right? So over here we have the placeholder for the ones. And then after we get to one, what do we get to? Ten. So we have the placeholder for the tens. And after we get ten tens, what do we get to? Hundred. And then a thousand. Yeah, let's don't go that far though. I can't add that. I can't add that big those big numbers like that. But that's exactly right. But that's the way the progression goes, right? So if we had nine one dollar bills and two ten dollar bills, how much money would you have? Twenty nine dollars. Nobody has trouble with that one, right? What did you say? Nineteen. Nineteen, no, twenty nine. Twenty nine. In binary, we made it a lot easier, a lot simpler, because we only have two numbers. Now, one of the things that's kind of important about techies and being in this business, which you are now because you're in this class, is zero represents something. It's a base number, right? No. Zero represents a placeholder. Well, I've got two numbers. And those two numbers are zero and one. If we threw zero away, we'd lose half of what we could represent, wouldn't we? So zero, when you do these things, actually represents something. Plot zero on a, on a plot zero on a much lot everything because it's there. How do techies count? Here's a new way to count: zero, one, zero, one. Really? No. That's all we got to do is go to one, right? These, yeah, these are the placeholders, just like we had the placeholders here. The first placeholder in binary is what? Is ones. So it represents a one in base ten. Because what we can you count? How, how do you do? How well do you do in counting in binary? I know one guy can do, can do binary in his head. I don't know what the period is. Yeah. Bob Loomis can do binary in his head. He thinks in binary, I think. I think I've heard he's like the... But... Huh? No. But... I like to use the numbering system that I've been using for most of my life. Don't you? Mm -hmm. Computers don't do that, though. Computers... Because it's binary, right? We've decided back... Well, it goes binary, so how far can the computer count to? How about one? Wait, one? Sure. What would 256 be? I have no idea. I'm just seeing it. I know. You're seeing that. You're guessing. But how far, how, how far can we count to here? We count up to one. nine. We got the ones and all the other good stuff. But we have placeholders. And here we have placeholders. So the first placeholder goes all the way to? One, so it can be a zero or a one. The second placeholder represents? Two. Told you all we got to do is multiply by two in this class, right? What's the next one represent? Four. What do you think that one is after it? Eight, 16, 32. You got it. Two, four, eight, 16, 32, yeah, 64, 128. I forgot four, didn't I? No, it's 84. No, it's not. It's four. 
it's 4. So if we had a binary number, what did we have before? 1, 1, this is not it. 1, 1, well, let's not do that. I like small numbers that I can add up easily. One, zero. How about 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1? What is that? I don't know. That's the part I don't get. Okay. What does this placeholder represent? One. one. What's one times one? One. Okay. What does this placeholder represent? What's zero times two? Zero. Good. What does this? I had to miss one again. Didn't I? What does this placeholder represent? Four. What's one times four? Four. Okay. Good. And this one represents? Eight. But it's got a zero. So it'll be eight times zero, which is zero. And this one is? Six. Teen. Oh. And this one is? Thirty. I mean zero. And this one is? Sixty-four. So what you do is just add those. Oh. So you 64 add. plus 16 is what? 64 is 10. 84. 85. 85. I don't get it though. Pretty simple to convert it, isn't it? Why do we want to convert it? Because we don't really think in binary, but the computer does. When we start writing addresses for the computer, writing subnet addresses, the binary becomes absolutely critical. How much of it is what part of the address? So number systems, in order to represent something from the for the computer, because computers use codes, don't they? They have these tables that they take numbers and we type in, you type in a, a letter, it actually represents a set of ones and zeros, zero an ASCII code. And that ASCII code, that ones and zeros are what are sent to the computer that it interprets. So binary, how we do those things, it's just like when we did the sample rate. How do we, how do, we do that? How do we do that? If we set this thing up and we divide it, had some voltage levels in here, let's say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and we did the sampling, and this one goes this high, it's a 1 volt, a 2 volt, so it, the binary can represent the voltage levels that really were the analog. Well, we, we like digital because it is cleaner. It's easier to clean up. The, the digital signals are really better because if we get noise on them, we know what the voltage level should be. And it's easy to distinguish between what's noise and what's signal. Because the signal can only be two things, right? Either on or off, one or zero. You only got the one frequency. You only got the one frequency. We may only have one frequency, so we'll get into that. The one voltage, yeah. We'll get into the frequencies here a little bit later. But we've got the one voltage. It can either, it's if, if it has a voltage, it's a one. And we're going to have these devices called repeaters, which actually regenerates a signal. How do you regenerate a, an analog signal? How do you recreate it? If it, if it gets messy, it becomes very difficult. You create a mess with it, you amplify it. That's not repeating, that's amplifying. Because when you amplify something, you amplify the noise along with it. And that's going to be the advantage of the binary is when we get it on this wire and we get some of this EMI, we get all that garbage on it, when it gets someplace we can regenerate the signal, you can strip the noise out and, and make it work. So, pretty straightforward, huh, Stephanie? And when we add all those up, you know what you get? 255. I'll give you a little hint. If you got all ones, if you got a one in the ones bits, it's always got to be an odd number. Because that's the only odd number there, isn't it? And if you add even numbers, you're always going to get an even number. So, since we've determined that zero represents something, what does zero do? How many things are in a zero to 255? Zero. 
No. Zero is a number. Zero represents something. If we go from zero to 255, how many things do we have? 256, because zero is a number. Zero represents something. And when we get on to the IP addressing, it's going to represent the network address. And the one that's all 255 is going to represent the broadcast address. This is the first step in subnetting, which we'll do next block. But the binary, there are other number systems, obviously, that are used hexadecimal. Hexadecimal will drive you crazy unless you, unless you cheat like I do and break it into two binary numbers. That's all it is. Instead of going all that way, hex, it just uses four bits. Octal's a little bit different situation. You, you kind of got to do it. But these are all number systems that computers may use. Are you going? Do you have to interpret them? Do you have to be able to, to be extremely knowledgeable in them? No, but you got to know. You need to be able to recognize them. That if you see them, that there are codes that you can look up. What's the code in? Is it a hex code? Is it an octal code? Is it a binary code? Is it a decimal code? So those kinds of things will work there. You want to take a break here for a few minutes? So the binary conversion, nothing magical about them, but you need to understand what's going on here, kind of what the machines use, because when we get into, again, subnetting in particular, look at some of these signals, uh, what kind of things are we doing? But Philip's saying you got to have binary to subnet. you got to have binary to subnet, because it becomes a matter, it really becomes a matter of following the ones. <clears throat> Binary system ones and zeros are representing in, in information easy to convert between binary and decimal. That is true, right? Easy to convert between binary and decimal, yes. as long as you know the placeholder. And you can go much further, obviously, but all we go to is 8 because what we really are using our binary for primarily is for IP addressing. <coughs> so that that's as far as we need to go. 255 is a high, 256 bits, 255 number is as high as we go. When we get to IPv6, we're going to have 128 bits instead of the 32 bits that we use at IPv4. So it's a much bigger situation, but all it is is controlling the binary again. Uh, no, no, we have not really convert. We, the U.S., haven't really made very little effort to go to IPv6. A lot of the rest of the world has because they're out of IP addresses. I well, looked, uh, I Googled A plus Windows 7 question A plus mm -hmm. exam over the weekend or whatever day before I took it. And I found a Jean Andrews who did that book, PowerPoint, about Windows 7, and she talked primarily about IP. Yeah, but they, they talk about it, but even Cisco doesn't ask IPv6 addressing. Yeah, that's not true. They had they in one of the tests they had one one question about it, but it, you didn't have to really know a whole lot about it. You just had to know how to configure the router to handle it. So it's not anything. It's coming, but it's not here yet. So we don't really focus on it. And they've been saying, they, the system, they, the experts, been saying, oh, IBV6 is going to right around the corner, going to be here next year for about six years now. So, yes, eventually we're going to have to go to it because they have issued, as far as I can tell, reading, have issued all the available uh, version 4 addresses. But then you get things like Microsoft is buying a company just simply to get its IP addresses. Uh, there are companies out there that are going out of business that own IP addresses. There are universities out there that own IP addresses that aren't being used. So, I think you should grab it back anyway. Hmm? I think whoever can grab it back anyway is going to send out something that says we're going to go get it. They, they can't do it because these, these companies own them. Because they were, what happens is, is, the, is the college universities that were in the very front end of the Internet, they got a bunch of them. I mean, some of these have have Class A networks, which have like 16 million addresses on them. Yeah, they have a real low-end hookup for them. I don't know. It's an ISP out there on Brown. I'll find it. Yeah. 
Bit. A bit is? A one or a zero. It's a single binary representation. When we had this thing up here, each of those placeholders represented a bit. And I was carefully counted and carefully miscounted to be sure that I had eight bits in there. Eight bits is a byte, and that's what we normally send information in is bytes. Typically represents a, a byte typically represents a piece of information. <clears throat> Overhead, non-data information. And when you look at the OSI model, we really put a lot of overhead on, don't we? Because you start out with the data at the application layer, and then what do you do? Put a header on it at every layer. And the frame sequence, that's just more header. More header until we break it into ones and zeros into bits at the, at the physical layer. So we do put quite a bit of overhead on these things in order to, why do we do all of that? Sure it's received at the correct location so that we can get it, get it to where it's supposed to go. To be properly routed and interpreted. Properly routed is a big deal. The layer two header is a big deal because when we're actually delivering, and I know I'm going up the next layer already, but when we're actually delivering information to a computer, uses the layer two address, the MAC address, to get it there. The IP address will get it in the building, or in our case, since we're broken up into networks in each room, we'll get it at the end of the room, but to get it to the specific location requires the layer two address. So it takes both of those addresses to get it there. One to get it from location to location, the other one to deliver it specifically to you. It's kind of like the letter goes, right, isn't it? When a letter, you're going to send a letter to New York, it goes into the big box, it goes to New York, they send it to New York, and New York then sends it to the correct, gives it to the mailman that takes it to a specific uh, address in the city. Data modulation, this is where we actually put information onto the, what was that frequency that was in the, that, that, that your radio station worked on? But what, what was the, what we call the frequency, that 96.3? What, what was that? What kind of frequency was that? Uh, what does that word say up there? Oh, wait. The very top one. Data No, the top <laughs> line. So the carrier wave. What's the carrier? Volts. What's the carrier? It's volts, but what's the carrier? Don't, don't try to make this too complicated. What's the carrier? <laughs> It's the frequency that takes that 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 has the data that's going to be put onto onto it. The carrier is just a constant. And look at this thing. It is this is just a constant waveform, and it has no data on it. It might be like a, a hum or something like that, a signal. Because when you listen to these carriers, sometimes you'll hear like boom, something like that. You know, a frequency. And then we put. The information, the volts, it talks about volts. What, what do the volts represent? I'm going to keep picking on you until you pay attention to me. What do the volts represent? The strength. The strength, exactly. Strength. Or amplitude. How strong is the signal? Okay, that was the form creeping. How strong is the signal? And then the, the wave down here, the information wave, would be the DJ talking, the music, or whatever else. Mm -hmm. And we combine these two. Now, this is a frequency modulated. You notice we didn't change the voltage on this one. But if you look at this thing, we did change the frequency, the rate that this thing changes. Because these are going faster down here than the ones in the middle, aren't they? So the frequencies actually change on these. FM modulation. The advantage to FM modulation, when we talked about the noise, if we get a lightning strike on one of these things, do we really care? 
All right, you just clip the top, and you take the and you take the noise away. Only if you get a hold of it. Only if you, that's right. But if you get noise on it, you can clip the top, make the noise go away. So FM modulation, and the other one, amplitude modulation. This is the one where we change the volts. We don't have we don't have a uh, an axis here, but You've got the signal, we've got the carrier signal, carrier signal, constant frequency, constant amplitude. And then when we put the intelligence on it, modulated the speech, music, whatever else we have, the frequency stays the same, but the amplitudes change on it. Now on this one, if we got interference on it, how are we going to take it off? Because we're changing the amplitude, it's tough to take it off of those. You can do some filtering, but if you get noise on it, you basically got noise on it. Because we're changing the amplitude, how do you, do you know how much of the amplitude to take off? Duplexing. What's duplexing, Stephanie? Duplexing? Mm hmm Transmission direction. What does transmission direction mean? Signals Where's it going, north, south, east, or west, right? Yeah, signals are mainly only control, I mean, travel in one direction. Hmm? I don't know. Well, it could be. Simplex. So you got that one. May travel in only one What does that mean, simplex? What does it mean, may travel in only one direction? It's calling your orders to tell it what to do. What would do that? Hmm? A to B. A to B. Point a to what would do that? Uh, radio station. Radio station. Simplex, because you you can call them up on a telephone, but not on that media. When we're talking about these things, we're talking about that particular media. How do we do these things? So simplex, one direction broadcast type arrangement. Half duplex, which is an older method, means that we can transmit and receive on the same piece of wire. Hmm? Telephone. telephone, yeah. We can drive. And, and, and Ethernet in its true sense. True Ethernet. Or a half duplex switch, which there are some. A hub is a half duplex device, which means that we can transmit and receive, but we can only do one at a time. So you transmit, everybody else is waiting until you get done. When you get done transmitting, then other people can transmit. CB radio, walkie-talkie would be an example of that. Hmm? CB radio. That would be an example of what? Kind of duplexing. Half duplex? Half duplex, because you can transmit and receive, but you can only do one at, one at a time. The other one's full duplex, which we re would really prefer. Free to travel in both directions simultaneously. So the equipment has progressed so that we can transmit and receive at the same time. Big advantage here because if we have a 100 megabit per second switch device and we go to full duplex, we actually get 200 megabits per second. You get 100 in each direction because the speed is in a direction. It's not a combined data rate. 100 megabit per second half duplex device, you can be waiting a while. Full duplex device, you can transmit and receive at the same time. Big advantage there. And it says the channel of distinct communications between the nodes may be separated logically or physically. Logical, logical separation, electrical separation. And this is a little representation here, but it's kind of true, isn't it? I know. Stick, our stick figures here. Simplex, the megaphone. The people at the basketball game, at the football game, at the whatever, telling you to you know stand up and yell or whatever else. <laughs> half duplex, half duplex. The uh, anybody ever use those Canon mm -hmm. string phones? Can you? You can. Tr you can talk and you can hear, right? But can you do both of them at the same time? No. So what is that? Half duplex. So you can only do half of what 
half of that here. Mobile phones, two-way communication simultaneously because you can you can talk commit, talk and receive at the same time on those things. So that would be a full duplex. Full duplex is where we really want to go with the equipment that we use. Multiplexing. Lots of different terms here again, right? Multiplexing, huh? Too many. Too many. Actually, let's put some of these terms on the board before we go much further. What are some of the terms? Help me out here, because I don't remember them all. Full duplex. Huh? Duplex. Duplex. Let's go back analog earlier. Let's go back before the break. Analog and digital. Analog and digital. Frequencies and. Let's, wait a minute. I can't. Talk, I can't write that. Analog. Analog, A and A L O G, and digital, right? Yes. What now? Uh, bytes. Bytes and bits. Bits, um, hertz, frequencies, voltage, volt, transmit, transmission. Volt, transmit. And amplitude. Amplitude. A lot of words. Binary. Binary. I should put up that up over bits and bytes, right? Yeah, phase and noise too. Phase. What else? Overhead. Overhead. Yeah, that's a good one. That's about it. Well, we didn't do the duplex, right? Oh. Simplex. Simple. channel. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of terms. It's a lot of terms, but what do they mean? What does analog mean? What does analog mean? Analog Constantly changing. Constantly changing. Actually what an analog signal is, is you put a piece, you put your pencil or your marker on the paper, you can't pick it up. Constantly changing. What is digital? Like a square. Like, like a square? It's like... It's, we represent them as squares. Let's try to get away from that. On and off. It's either a one or a zero, all right? On or off. Zero or positive. What was a byte? What was a byte? Help me out. What's a byte? Carries one piece of information. Carries one information. It's eight bits, right? What's a bit? Every a one or a zero. Yeah. <clears throat> What's a hertz? Someone, somebody steps on your toe? No. <laughs> one complete change, one it's cycle. Named by the it's named by the German one complete cycle. One hertz is one cycle oh. per second. Like. One complete cycle. I can't pronounce the name. Of What's the frequency? Frequency is the number of times he waves it. Number and waves per second, right? Yeah. So frequency is measured in hertz. Amplitude is measured in volts. 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 When we talk about volts, and in electricity, we're going to have resistance, <coughs> pressure. And then we're going to have current. We're going to have voltage, current, and resistance in these things. In the uh, world of, if you're using a water hose, what these things would actually represent, the current would be the water itself, how much of it's coming out. The resistance would be how much you open the nozzle. And the voltage would represent the water pressure. So when we talk about voltages and a higher voltage, it's how much pressure, how much push goes on the current. The current's the thing it has the, that actually is the electricity itself. So what does transmit mean? It means to issue signals. Issue signals to send something. If you transmit, then we hope that if we transmit, somebody receives. And, and the CB radio that you want, you Press the key and you transmit, right? You send the signal out there. So amplitude, we talked about amplitude is how many volts it is, how high the signal is. Binary is? The computer language. Computer language, ones or zeros. 
phase. It refers to the progress of ways over time. Yeah, ratio. which is kind of a lot of words to say that they start at different times. How much they're offset, How much they're offset by, by starting time. Phase difference here, one starts before the other one. They go the same frequency, they have the same amplitude, just one starts before the other one. Overhead, non-data information. Non information. What is overhead? We're all overhead, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, IT is overhead, is that not true? Yeah. Well, I think of that, but it is. Staples, you're not overhead, though, are you? You're not, because you sell stuff. You bring money into the company. What product does IT make? Real IT? Support. Support. So we really are overhead. Support. Does IT make the company more efficient? Yeah. But it doesn't make anything. Sure. We hope. Yeah. We hope. There's nothing else to keep it yeah. online. Simplex. Travels in one direction. Travels in one direction. What, what does that? What's an example of that? Like oh, how about 96.3? How about yeah. the radio station? 96.3. Yeah, the radio station. That's simplex, isn't mm -hmm. it? Half duplex? It travels in both directions. But like one, at a, time. Yeah, one at a time. One at a time. Yeah, one at a time. That full duplex? Oh, both directions. Simultaneously. Transmit and receive simultaneously. So there, there really is a bunch of, there really is a lot of terms in this chapter. And we're getting ready to, to do another one, multiplexing. So I guess we might as well add it to the list, huh? What does multiplexing mean? It says so right there, right? Sure. A transmission form allowing multiple signals. What the heck does that mean? Yeah, what it does is allows, it says transmission form allowing multiple signals to travel simultaneously over one medium. Do you watch TV? Do you watch cable TV? Mm -hmm. You gonna give me that one too? It's not enough time. Please don't take my iPod. It actually helps me concentrate. Do you watch, do you watch cable TV? Watch cable TV? Anybody watch cable TV? Yep. Huh? I don't have cable, but I watch cable. You don't have cable, but you watch TV? Nobody has cable? You have cable. How many channels are there? I got over 900. How many wires? How many wires? Uh-huh. Like one or two. One usually, right? It's the antenna that goes into the back of the... How do you get all them channels in that one wire? Because it's programmed to be like that. Program to be like that. What's that? Pro what's that program to be like that called? Multiplexing. Multiplexing. When we do what? When you allow multiple. Signals. Allowing multiple signals, we let channel seven, channel ten, channel thirteen, channel twenty-seven, channel three hundred three, channel all of those on the same medium simultaneously. They're all there. It filters out. The, that's what the tuner does. Huh? Is a network? Is that, for example, is that behind me going to one switch? Probably not. Uh, we'll get into this. That that's handled a little differently. Yeah, because what that does is actually creates a dedicated path. Multiplexing allows multiple signals over a single piece of medium. And a LAN probably not going to do that. A WAN has the protocols to do that. Yeah. Yeah, multiplexers, yeah. Yeah. Channel logically separated into subchannels. And there are a number of ways that we can do that. Multiplexer amongst, a multiplexer is a device that multi puts multiple signals on a single uh, piece of media. Stephanie, do you listen to anything that's multiplexed? Listen to anything? Mm-hmm. You just 96.3, right? We're going back to that radio station. 96.3? What's wrong with 96.3? I didn't say anything's wrong with it. Is it stereo? Yes, it is. Because it comes through triangle. Sort 
how do they get that stereo signal there? It's all how they do it. It's all how do they do that? It's only actually one wire for the antenna to pick it up. But the antenna has nothing to do with it. How do they how do they get how do they get the right and the left channel out there? How do they get all that information on that and it's not a real big bandwidth on FM. How do they get all that information on that little channel? One of the things that's even more interesting is you know that when color TV came about with a more complex signal, they didn't change the amount of bandwidth that they got from black and white. So they had to put multiple signals on a single medium. What the uh, FM does is they take the right channel and left channel and mix them together. And then when they get to the, to the demultiplexer at the other end, it takes them back apart and separate, separates them into channels. So, by the way it puts the signal on the medium, it's then able to do that. Multiplexers at the single end of the of sending end of the channel, the multiplexer separates combined signals and regenerates them in their original form on the receiving end. So to get a stereo radio signal, we would take the left channel, the right channel, and we got put them together using a multiplexing device onto the same medium, the same frequency, or a, a wireless or radio frequency. Send it out through the atmosphere, get it to Stephanie's radio, receive the signal, and then the radio itself has a demultiplexer, which takes it apart and reconstructs the, the right and the left channel. So is it bidirectional as well, multiple? In this case, probably not. It can be. If if you're talking about if we're going on a network, we have a multiplexer and demultiplexer. From one, yeah, kind of like a modem, yes. It can be. If you were going I guess I on a network. It's either or, like duplex, duplex or multiplex. Or well, you can, you, uh, you can have, it depends on the device. Multiplexer and demultiplexer, typically they're going to do both. This is like a modem, a modulator, demodulator. Uh, yeah, it modulates at one end, demodulates at the other, but when it sends the answer back, it, go, it works in the other direction. So, yeah, you're probably going to have, unless you get something that's very specific, it's going to do both. Duplexing types, time division, multiplexing, intervals of time. That's when, and the way I kind of like to think about this is like a roller coaster maybe. Because if you go up, people get on a roller coaster, you got people lined up and you got the little time slots, the seats that people get into. And then you go to the next time slot and people get into and the next time slot. So we divide the transmission medium up into time slots that information goes into to send it across the network. So in multiple intervals of time, with these things. Statistical, and these kind of work together. Time division multiplexing just sends these things based on each typically time, typically time division multiplexing, each of the different signals is going to get part of the time slot, regardless of priority. Statistical assigns the time slots based on a priority system. So there has to be a priority system set up so the ones that are got the prior ones, the ones first that have the highest priority are going to get the time slots first. Wave division multiplexing used in fiber allows the cable to carry multiple signals because when we look at light, how many frequencies are in this light? Let's just say many. And if you had a prism, what does a prism do? Breaks it out into individual frequencies, doesn't it? So what if we broke it out into these individual frequencies, put the information on the individual frequency, and then made it white light again, and sent it along its way? Actually, in the multimode fiber, there are going to be different frequencies. So you can have multiple signals to different frequencies, fiber, being one of the ones for wave division. And they've got dense dense wave division multiplexing, which is just more more of it. I didn't put that one up here. Combines all the light waves. When it gets to the other end, separates the signals again and takes the intelligence off of the individual frequencies. 
I thought this one was kind of neat that I could actually get this thing to move up here. Time division multiplexing. Okay. It's time division multiplexing, representation. Conversation A gets its information, and when it comes back up, conversation A goes to conversation A. Conversation B gets connected, conversation C, each of them on a time basis gets some connectivity as you go around this thing. It's kind of like the system refreshing process. Sounds like system refreshing process in Windows, exactly. How fast does this happen? Fairly fast. Fairly fast. How fast is fairly fast? Yeah, I think probably about 400, about 100 megahertz, 400 megahertz, something like that. Interesting. Relationships between nodes and the nodes here we're going to talk about, and there are two basic ways we can do things, point to point or point to multipoint. They're both, rep both represented here. These can be wireless. Wireless is represented here. They can also be wired. What was the one multiplexing? We did multiplexing, so we got multiplexing, right? Mm -hmm. And now we got node relationships, right? Nodes. And what we have point to point, what's point to point mean, you think? Computer, computer building to build, building, site to site, router, router, those kinds of things. What about point to multi point? The radio again, except in this case, we might have a duplexed situation. Those become if we had a router here that went to multiple sites, point to multi point. Typically, they're going to be point to point. Some of these things, they look real simple when you draw them, but they they become a little bit more complex when you try to manage them. Would a hub be multipoint since it broadcasts to everything on the network? No, that'd be bus. Bus, okay. Okay, one of the things when we talk about some of these, and, and we might as well talk about this right now, talk about channel. Channel would be something that would be in a hub or a switch. It would be channel medium, the channel itself. And then we're going to have, uh, and I'll, Get find my picture of it. This is what's called a seven-part data circuit, which would be things that would from routers that would connect these different locations together, which are a little different than the channel circuit. Than the channel, the channel is it gets into a channel and it just goes. So it would be you can have it be a channel, channel media. Uh, the other ones, these are going to have a thing called the DTE and the DCE, the that terminal data terminal equipment, data uh, configuration equipment. And each of those have different functions. We'll talk about RS-232. If you look at the RS-232, they're usually RS-232 serial type connections to do those. Because how far can we? Didn't get there yet. But how far do you think Ethernet can go? 100 meters. How far can serial go? I mean, we really have trouble. We'd really we'd go like forever. We'd really have trouble getting around the Internet if we could only go 100 meters from it. We're going to go to Hong Kong 100 meters at a time. It's probably not going to work very well. <laughs> so you have to have different standards for different requirements. But what you'll find out, I think, that the farther you go, the slower you go. Because when we get out on the Internet, what's the speed of your, of your connection at home? Hmm? Slow. That's because you're on that telephone thing. I think mine's like four, four megabits per second on cable. Cable. Yeah. DSL. DSL depends on what you what you buy. I think yeah. Stewart's got a DSL. Depends on what you buy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're all they're all the 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 speeds that they give you are always download speed because I think cable's like four down and seven fifty up or something like that. But how fast is that compared to how fast is how fast are we going in here? Hundred meg. Oh. Except going to the knock we're going thousand meg. But we're not going nearly as far. 
So when I get on the longer distances, I have different standards. The speed generally is going to slow down. Now, there are some really high-speed connections out there, obviously. It costs a lot of money, depending on how much you want to pay for those things. So relationship between nodes, point-to-point -point, uh, versus broadcast transmission, point-to-point, multi-point. This, show, this shows broadcast, and yet this could be broadcast point-to-point. -point. And we also have point-to-multi-point, -point, which to me makes a little more sense. Broadcast, typically one direction. Wow, well, that's, let me back up on that. On network broadcast, that may or may not be the case. Network broadcast sends it to all of the stations, and that's what any broadcast is going to do. Uh, or do we want to go to a single point? And that's what we do in a networking, isn't it? If we want to find, and, and I'll jumble and we'll review these things again, uh, if we want to find the MAC address, because the MAC address is the one that actually gets it to, if I want to send something to Stuart, that's the MAC address of his computer is the one that actually gets it there. How do I find that out? What if, what if one of the examples, I'm going to pretend to be, uh, I'm financial, financial aid and I don't know you guys. And I go in here and say, Stuart West. That's the way these things, and it's a, it's a protocol called ARP that says, hey, who's got this IP address? Because the IP address got us into the room. Who's got this IP address? We're like those guys would say, what room is Stuart in? Or actually, they would say, what room is Intro to networking in. Oh, that's in room 111. So that would be the routing that got them to the correct room, to them, because we were they're breaking up by class. And then we get in here is, I need to talk to Stuart West. So that's me. Same thing happens on the network. The layer three, the routing, gets us into the room, gets us to the network address. Once we get there, there is a broadcast that goes to all of the computers that says, who's got this particular IP address? And that particular IP address will say that whatever their MAC address has the IP address. So broadcasts are things that are necessary. They take up a, a lot of and if you, when you start doing packet sniffing, a broadcast take up an awful lot of small uh, networking traffic. There's a tremendous number of broadcasts go on on a particularly a Windows network. Windows can't not broadcast. You do. Uh, it doesn't last very long. <clears throat> the computer itself has an ARP table. So it clears it and refreshes it every Well, it drives it, 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 and you'll see different numbers, and the only thing to do it is just actually look at it and see what happens. It keeps it in the cache for a different amount of time based on whether it reuses the re reuses or not, but it doesn't stay much over two minutes anyway. But you can force a refresh. Yeah, you can dump it. You can dump it. You yeah, and you can put you can put static. ARP entries in if you want to do that. I've often wondered because the default gateway is the one that you go to the most because that's how you get out. I've often wondered why they don't put a static entry or, or at least a persistent entry in for the default gateway, but they don't. you got to find it every time you want to go out if it's been more than a couple minutes. Not big packets. doesn't take a lot of information, a lot of time, but it's there. All that stuff is there. Throughput and bandwidth. Throughput the amount of data transmitted during a given time. And we a lot of times call that bandwidth. What's the bandwidth? What we're really talking about is throughput. How much data is actually getting through? Bandwidth is the difference between the highest and lowest frequencies a medium can transmit. What bandwidth typically is, is the capacity. How big, that we're how big is the pipe and the throughput? How much can you put actually put through the pipe? Yeah, exactly. Baseband, broadband, we'll do this and then we'll take a break. 
What's broadband? What, 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 huh? Not really. What's really is broadband? It's the connectivity pretty much like... But to give me an example of something that is broadband. Mobile broadband. Mobile broadband. To give me an example of something that is broadband. And and why do you think that... Why were you saying that the cable is broadband once we get there? Is FM radio broadband? Hmm? Is FM radio broadband? Yeah, it could be. What about cable TV? Why is it broadband? Because it's got like different. It's got a whole different bunch of different things on it. Yeah. Why? Why? When, when we talk about broadband internet, we're really typically talking about DSL broadband because we have voice as well as data on the same piece of media, or cable where we have data and the television signal on the same piece of media. So, broadband, baseband digital signals sent directly are sent through DC pulses applied to a wire. Boy, that's a mouthful. It makes no sense, isn't it? What baseband means is it's got one frequency. Baseband, this kind of stuff, Ethernet's going to be a baseband arrangement. A broadband has multiple frequencies on it, back to the cable TV. Multiple multiple frequencies. Uh, voice gonna voice uses a different frequency than does data. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who I don't know who made the things up, uh, but they did. So baseband systems can transmit one signal at a time. Ethernet is an example of that. A single frequency. Uh, broadband, multiple signals, again, cable TV would be an example of that. Modulators, radio frequency, RF analog, use the different frequencies, does not encode the information as digital pulses. And when we get to the nomenclature of, actually we should write down baseband and broadband here in our words, huh? How many frequencies does baseband have? One. How many frequencies does broadband have? I don't have any idea. As many as the wire can handle, as many as you put on it. So that's the one that we really don't know. But baseband we know has how many frequencies? One. So we're going to get there. One frequency. When we start getting nomenclatures, and I know I jump ahead and we'll get to these things, when we start talking about wire, you're going to see things like 10 base T or 10 base 2 or 100 base T. The base means that it's a baseband signal. If it's whatever broad is a broadband signal. So the base in the 10 base, 100 base, whatever base is baseband. If it's broad, it's broadband. The 10 means 10 megabits per second. The T means it's twisted pair. T twisted pair. Two is, uh, that's a uh, thin net means 185 meters. I don't know why they came up with that, but if you ever see 10 base 2, it's, it's, I got one here, it's this stuff, it's this stuff, thin net, 10, that's 10 base 2, T's twisted pair, 10 base 2 is, Coax. Hmm? 10 megabits over coax. Coax, they said that, that I've read said it can go to 100 meg, but no, I don't think anybody's using coax anymore. It's not really, really that easy to work with. Get the picture here, and I guess this is a good time. Is anyone take a break?
I try to do these. I really do want to try to do these things like because there's a lot of terminology in this in this chapter. So the broadband, baseband, single frequency, multiple frequency, multiple multiple channels in the broadband uh, to allow simultaneous use of it. Transmission flaws, and we saw a picture earlier, electromagnetic interference. And EMI, EMI electromagnetic interference can come from a lot of sources. Fluorescent lights, uh, transmission lines, lightning, all sorts of stuff. What it does is just puts a spurious signal on our signal so that we uh, don't get a true representation of the data. RFI, radio frequency, electromagnetic caused by radio waves. So EMI is a, is a little bit different here. RFI would be radio frequency if you drive past a radio station, although I've never had that happen a lot. You can get signals onto your copper as you go past these things. EMI is electromagnetic. These are things, again, truly like the lights, the power lines, those sorts of things. The difference here is the frequency that they use. RFI radio frequency is in the, what's called the radio range, and, and I don't ask me to quote you the, the specific frequencies, but those are what those use. Crosstalk is signal traveling on a wire or cable infringes on a signal traveling on an adjacent wire. That's a a bunch of gobbledygook here. What does that mean? If we had two parallel wires and we got a signal on them, two parallel wires and we got some noise on them, crosstalk means that the one would, through electromagnetic waves, would then put itself on the other one. So. And what usually happens on this is noise, EMI. We get it on each of these, and if these things are the same, then the two signals amplify each other because they become additive, and it makes the noise worse. This crosstalk is we have a signal on one wire, and they get compressed, they get close together, and the signal from one wire goes onto the other one. And you probably may have experienced something like that if you ever had one of the old portable telephones, where you were, or even a telephone. I had a telephone that would sometimes get somebody else's phone calls. That's crosstalk, because I'm hearing their conversation. I'm not on their phone line. But for some reason, the signal is coming over into mine. And the way that happens, did, it, did physics class, how many of you physics? Okay, now, look, it's been longer for me than you. We know that because we know when I had my first uh, computer class. But one of the things, one of the experiments frequently done is with magnets and, and particles and resisting and, and making the, the different shapes with the magnets, with attracting and... and uh, repelling the particles. If you do that with electricity, it's going to do the same thing because it sets up a magnetic field. Now, how do you make electricity? What do you got to have to make electricity? No, no, no. We don't have power. That's what we're trying to make. An exchange of electrons? An exchange of electrons? Protons? Protons? Neutrons? Neutrons? Dad. You're guessing, aren't you? No, that's actually what makes up. That's what actually makes up an atom. But what we want to do is have electricity, which is the flow of electrons, right? How do we generate electricity? You ever generate electricity in high school? No, I did not. Huh? I got a Honda in a garage. Got a Honda in a garage. Okay, you got a Honda in a garage. What does it got to have to make electricity other than gasoline? A generator. A generator. What's that the generator in? Power. Great. You got to have a prime mover. That's your power. That's your engine. What we have? We got magnets, right? We got permanent magnets here. These are really not very clever permanent magnets, but we got permanent magnets. And then what we got to have in the middle? What we got in the middle? Coil of wire. And what do you do? You move the coil of wire through the magnetic field, and it creates electricity. When we have these parallel wires, we have 
this moving force here, and what's it going to do? It's going to induce a signal in the other parallel wire. When we get to twisted pair, you know, one of the reasons we twist these things? Because if we twist these things, and we have a signal here, and a signal here, they're going to cancel each other because they're offset a little bit, just enough to, to golly, we got this phase shift now, don't we? We talked about phase shift. This is where phase shift works for us. So we do this thing. But anyhow, crosstalk is when the wires get close enough together that the signal from one gets induced in the signal. That only happens in copper because of the electromagnetic features of it. Can't happen in fiber because fiber is light. Probably won't happen in shielded because the shield's going to stop that. What's, what they're going to do? So we put the wrong signal on the wrong wire, the wrong signal on the right wire. A certain amount of noise is, is unavoidable, and we're going to have noise, noise all around, noise in the atmosphere, noise in the room, noise in the lights, on and on and on and on and on. One of the things that can happen with copper is it creates its own field of signal. Those signals can be intercepted. They can be received. Like, like an antenna? Like an antenna, yeah. Do they go real far? No. But they're there. When we talk about media, that's one of the differences between copper and fiber. Fiber doesn't have any of that. Fiber is light. It doesn't have any of the electromagnetic properties because it's glass and light. All forms are measured in decibels, dB, and dB is, is a measure of noise, typically. So we measure the noises in the dBs. And this is the better picture than I can draw, although I tried earlier. Noise, attenuation, well, they said attenuation and the noise. Attenuation is a new term, isn't it, Stephanie? Yeah. What does that mean? What's attenuation? It's lost, it's lost the signal strength as it's traveled away from its source. That means the farther the signal goes, the weaker it gets. Just like cell phones. Just like because, cell phones. Yeah. Because yep. the signal stops. Right, that's just like everything. And, and one that's, that's a little, cell phones are true, but those cell phones, we just know that happens. Something that's, very visual, what if you ran out of gas going down the hill in your car? And your power steering pump still worked so that you didn't die right off the road. What's going to happen when you get to the bottom of the hill? Eventually. But how long is it going to take you to stop? Depends on how fast you're going and how steep the hill is. How fast you're going how steep the hill is. So as we go down this thing, we're going to be attenuated because of the rolling resistance of the wheels and we're going to slow down. The same thing happens if we get a signal, we get a piece of copper or fiber or anything else. We have a signal here as it goes down the wire, the media, it's going to be reduced in strength. What we have to be aware of, and we have maximum distances that these things can go, is what's too small? What's too small? What will happen when the signal gets smaller than the noise? Because we looked at the binary at the digital signal. That was pretty easy to clean up, right, because it's either there or it's not. It's either a 1 or a 0. You can either say, oh, yeah, it's there, or nope, it's not. But what if the signal gets smaller than the noise? You can't find the signal anymore. So you have to be aware of how far you can go with these things before it's too small that you can no longer repeat it. Uh, noise causes issues with these things. They say amplifier. Amplifier is, is a dirty word. We don't really amplify, we repeat. If we amplified, and it doesn't look like they did a whole lot of anything with this, did they? If we amplified, we would amplify the noise as well as the signal. And it wouldn't do you any good because everything would grow proportionally. 
the objective and one of the advantages of binary is it's either there or it's not. It's on or it's off. So once you determine the signal, you can renew the signal. And they do renew. They don't just amplify. They renew. Make it just like it was a brand new signal and start it all over again. One of the advantages of fiber over copper is there's no noise. There's no EMI. Because it's immune. It's light. It's light and it's coated and it's in plastic. So you can go a lot farther. You can actually have up to about a 98% signal loss in fiber before you have to renew it. You can't do that with copper. We're going to go with twisted pair. We're going to go 100 meters before we have to renew the signal. So when we start. It depends on the fiber. And if you look at those things, depending on where it's single mode, multi mode, which type of fiber it is, there's glass fiber and there's plastic fiber. Plastic fiber is pretty short range. Plastic fiber is using things like airplanes though, because you wouldn't like you don't want it to shatter when they land. And cars. Cars use some fiber. They usually use plastic fiber and it only goes just a few feet. Uh, single mode fiber, I think it's six kilometers, something like that. Actually, and some of the some of the well, actually, some of the high-powered lasers can go farther than that. So there's there's lots of variables in fiber. There's no good rule, no good rule. I don't think good rule of thumb for fiber. But in copper, any of the T's, 100 meters is a good choice. So we have all these different things that can create noise, and this is the repeater here. This this has got it does have a good representation. We've got this noisy signal here. It goes through the repeater. Once it gets through, it is a renewed signal. The signal is made new again. This is kind of a picture of crosstalk. Now what it shows here, we have the disturbing cables. I love, I love some of the language that they will use. We have the victim cable here in the middle. And we have the disturbing cables around it. The disturbing cables and the red arrows represent the signals being put on to it. This one, whatever language this is, I think it's Greek. It could be. I don't know. But what this shows is parallel wires. And the circles here represent the electrical signal on these things and show you that as the electric signals go out, they can generate a signal in the other wire. And if we compress these things, then you would have a stronger signal as you bring, as you bring them closer together. And that's when we get into the wire. How are, how are they done? How are they twisted? Do they have shielding? All sorts of different considerations for the media itself. Latency just simply means delay. And there's lots of things that can cause latency. Switches cause quite a bit of latency, actually, because they, they can do quite a bit of processing. Latency can be the cable length, connect, connecting devices, anything that causes the signal to get delayed. Length of cable, what kind of cable? If you look at, and I couldn't find a good chart of these things, but each of the Media itself, depending on what it is, coax, for instance, we said 10 base 2, 200 meters for it, for that. The old 10 base 5 was 500 meters. So different media go different distances. Even different copper media go different distances. Fiber obviously typically goes further than copper, but those things have maximum distances. Each of the Coppers, the, the size of the, of the wire have different speeds that, the, that they operate at, different resistances, different ways to get there. The round trip time is the time for packets to go from one, one sender to the receiver and back. And the reason we have round trip time is that's what we're going to measure with our ping, with our pings, with our tools that we can use on the network to check for connectivity at different layers of of the OSI model. Cable, it, cabling is ready for the maximum number of connected network segments. 
how much, how many, how many can be connected to it. And there's lots of variables that would go into how many computers, how many nodes could be on a, uh, on a, on a segment. Whether you're on a hub, whether you're on a switch, what kind of topology are we using? We'll get into those next week, into the topologies. Transmission methods assign a maximum, a maximum segments. Throughput, and that is the thing that we really worry about, isn't it? How much can we get through? The bandwidth, bandwidth is the theoretical. Okay, on my cable modem, I got a bandwidth of four megabits per second. But if I have some sort of a restriction, some a bad piece of media, some sort of restriction between one point and the other, I'm not going to get the bandwidth. I'm going to have a specific throughput. How much can I actually get through the existing infrastructure? Limited by signaling, multiplexing techniques, used in given methods. And Chris was talking about what, 2,400 baud, right? 2,400 baud. And a baud is, what's a baud? What does baud mean? Changes per second. So what we're really talking about is 2,400 baud, because we could put a signal on each of these changes, right? So how do we get 56K out of 2,400? By using that binary. By using that binary. What if we set this thing up zero to whatever that, when we go up here, we go up to zero, one, two, three, to represent a particular binary number. And this might represent what one, zero, one, three, four, five. Now we go back to our conversions. So if we go to three, what might that represent? Three might represent if we go with a one, two, four, eight, three where we represent a one, one. So what we can do by the way we encode the signals is put more data on a single change than we would would if we only use one bit. The baud rate used one bit per change. The bit rate, the data rate uses an encoding to allow us to put more information on the channel as, as we go through those things. Transmission methods, fiber cables achieve faster throughput than those using copper or wireless connections, and that's just generally true. Fiber is going to tend to be a cleaner signal. It's going to tend to go further. I don't know that I would say throughput because throughput is what we actually push through. You're going to have 100 megabit per second fiber. You're going to have 100 megabit per second copper. You're going to have gigabit copper. You're going to have gigabit fiber. So it depends on what media you buy, how much you can actually get through it. What's the data rate that you're going to use on these things? Noise is an issue with copper. Noise is not an issue with fiber. So when you get that question that says that you're putting in a network in a uh, power substation, what kind of media you're going to use, you're going to say fiber. Because you would never get a signal through there on copper, would you? Probably not. You have two feet, you'd have to have a repeater. And we're going to get into the repeater rules here a little bit later. And I'm going to lie to you about them. And then I'm going to tell you the truth about them. Because we'll have to lie to you to, for the rule and then say, ah, because the equipment's come so much further, it's really not true anymore. But you still need to know the rule. Cost, lots of variables affect the final cost. We talk about fiber. Fiber is great. Why don't we use fiber? Install is expensive. We talked about that the other day. A pair, a good pair of crimpers, what, $50, $60 maybe? A fiber microscope to check your fiber connection costs about $12,000.
the fiber itself is not a lot more expensive than the uh, copper, but the tools that you need. The fiber ends, an RJ45 connector, which we put on the end of twisted pair, RJ45 connector, I don't know, probably 60 cents, something like that. Fiber connector is about five dollars. So, what does it cost? How much are you going to spend? You really have to take the whole package into consideration. And where are you putting it? Because it wouldn't matter how much fiber costs and copper costs if we're putting it into an environment that's got a lot of noise because you can't use copper there. You're going to have to use the fiber. So the cost of the installation, cost of new infrastructure versus reusing the old infrastructure. When we moved into this building, <coughs> there was some coax still available and we were told to put coax in. So we were able, we tried at least to reuse some of the wrong type of coax as it wound up. It, had the wrong, it was the wrong impedance. But can you use the existing infrastructure? If we put fiber in this whole building, we'd have to rerun everything. If we've got the copper configured so that we can go to the next level, let's say we want to put gigabit, gigabit NICs in the machines, then the infrastructure would probably be suitable for that. We wouldn't have to redo all the wire. If we wanted to do fiber, we would obviously have to redo all the wire. You have to consider all of the requirements when you decide what you want to put in how much does it cost? What are your security requirements? How fast do you need to go? How much How much privacy do you need? Lots of different considerations. And the cost of maintenance and support. Isn't going through the practice never inherit somebody else's mess? Never inherit, yeah, but that's tough to do. <laughs> never inherit somebody else's mess. Oh, well, wouldn't we all love to do that? Let's just rip everything out and start all over. That's pretty expensive, though. I'd love to put fiber in here. I, I think that... And this is opinion. You can't say anything outside of this room. Of course, I'm recording this, so I'm shooting myself in the foot, huh? <laughs> but we really should have fiber going from the rooms to the knock. Because when you get this overhead, there's a lot of stuff. Oh, Phil talked about the wires for light. There's motors up there for the, uh, for the ventilation system. All sorts of interferences up there that have electrical implications. So, would it help? Yeah, probably, maybe. Some of the rooms are a lot weirder than others. Not been in many of them. In, in, in this small footprint, you wouldn't notice. Maybe. The answer is maybe. Depends on how close you're getting to lights. Because if you if you run from here to there in a the small footprint, if you run that copper close to those fluorescents, you're going to notice. They'll kill it. Yeah, there's lots of stuff. The probably logical way this is a this is a false deck plate. Well, this building was a data center before we moved in here. This was a one of the banks. I don't know which one was a data center. They had a mainframe over where the uh, for the library. I think it probably came in partly into this room. But there was a mainframe in the center of this thing, in the center of this building. And there were there was some wiring, some infrastructure here. It wasn't really usable for us, but some of it was there. And I guess that says do, can you use the infrastructure? If you have existing infrastructure, be sure it's right because there was coax. Oh yeah, we'll just use that coax. Well it was the wrong kind. And it would, it's one of those that would work sometimes and it wouldn't work sometimes and you'd be going really good and all of a sudden it just quit because the, yeah, we had resistance mis impedance mismatches. Drive you crazy. Cost of lower transmission media affecting productivity. Is that going to happen? We're going to put in copper, but we're not going to be able to do as much. We're not going to be able to go as far. Or if you're going long distances, and you talked about a small footprint, if you're going long distances, how much is it going to cost you for the equipment to get the signal there? Because you're going to have to do those things. Cost of obsolescence going out, going obsolete. 
Copper has changed, and of course, uh, fiber has changed quite a bit over the years too. But what can we do with these things? And the old copper, the Cat Three, Category Three, we'll have categories here in a few minutes. Category three, you can't use that stuff in a category five environment because it just will not handle the data. I was either reading or watching something and said that was having a problem put in a new system. I had a problem, I had this patch cord, brand new laptop, brand new cord, everything worked, 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 worked. Finally got around to going to change the ends on the wire because I thought maybe the wire was bad when we cut the end off. So I knew the problem right away it was a Cat3 cable and a Cat5 system. It was a 10 megabit per second cable and a 100 megabit per second system because the manufacturer had sent them a wrong cable. That happens occasionally. Well, look at that. How do you check those things? You need, you need to assure yourself that you're putting in the stuff that's supposed to be there. Size and scalability, the, uh, the uh, specification determines size and scalability of the network media. Maximum nodes per segment depends on attenuation and latency. What was attenuation? The loss, of loss of signal. What's latency, Stephanie? We didn't put latency up here, did we? No. What's latency? I guess you could kind of think of latency as latency, right? As late. Yeah, it's delay. Yeah. It's just delay. How long does it take to get there? You don't know. It's just a matter of. That is something that that is kind of measurable. How much is it? What devices? How many devices? We know that switches have latency. What kind of switch are you going to buy? Attenuation and latency. Attenuation, attenuation and latency. Are you going to buy the bottom of the line switch? Latency is probably going to be very high on those. Are you going to buy the top of the line switch or are you going to buy something in the middle? Uh, we really want the top of the line switch, but sometimes those get really expensive. I mean, when you go out and you look at those Cisco $70,000, $100,000 switches, I'm not so sure about them. Of course, those are big switches, too. But what are we going to do in this? Maximum segment length. Attenuation, latency, and segment type. And when we talk about segment link, we'll talk about those when we talk about Ethernet. How far and why are we limited to 100 meters on Ethernet? I guess we could talk about that a little bit. Now, now that we said it's 100 meters, what you've got to be able to do is be able to detect a collision at the far end. So it actually is based on how long it takes a signal to get from one end of the wire to the other end of the wire and detect it. Populated segment contains in nodes. When we talk about these things, in nodes in um, in an Ethernet, in nodes are those that have to be terminated. And I talk about termination. Termination is not a big deal in switches because they're self-terminating. If you're using these old 10 base 2, 10 base 2, these have whoop, physical terminators on them. That come off, and has, there has to be a terminator at each end. All these things are resistors that absorb the excess signal. And if you don't have that, it gets bounced back onto the bounce back onto the bus itself, and you get collisions. And that would be not a good thing. Maximum network length. Some of the networks segment length. They talk about these things, and they haven't addressed. And I'll, I'll I will here haven't addressed the maximum length. This rule called the five four three rule which is an Ethernet rule. Ethernet, an Ethernet segment can be 100 meters, okay? Trust me on that one. What the 543 rule says, and that's for twisted pair. If we use 10 base 5, it could be 500 meters, so we could go further. What the 543 rule says is that we can have five, a maximum of five segments separated by four repeaters, four devices, and three of those segments may be populated. I'll have some pictures here in a minute of that. But that's what the 543 rule. And that's going to dictate, we we'll say the maximum network length is the sum of the lengths of the network. What kind of media did we choose? If we chose 10 base 2, it would be 185 meters in each one of them. If we chose 10 base 5, 500 meters. And if we chose 10 base T, 100 meters. So that means that if we use 10 base T, the maximum we can go in a true Ethernet is 500 meters. 
if we use the old uh, 10 base 5 coax, we could go 2.5 kilometers because 5 times 500 meters is 2.5 kilometers. That's quite a ways to go with copper. It depends on how fast the signal travels in each of the media. Connectors, that's what we put onto the media in order to connect to the devices. Now we're going to go through some things. Everything the medium requires is a specific kind of connector, and I've got a number of slides here that have the connectors at this one book said, this is what CompTIA wants you to know, so I'm going to have pictures of the ones that, that, they, that somebody else at least says, this is what CompTIA wants you to know, and there's nothing dramatic about them. A media converter is a hardware enabling segments of a different media to connect to something else, and I don't have anything clever like a, a media converter for, you know, fiber to twisted pair, but I do sort of have one is called an AUI that takes a serial port and converts it to an RJ45. You would plug these, these were on, on the old routers because what you would have to do, depending on what you wanted, you'd buy the AUI to convert from a serial to whatever media that you wanted. So this would be a sort of a media converter in these things. And so we go from one, one type media to another. The, best way to get from one to another is to go across a router because a router will do those kinds of conversions. You can have a, a token ring port or a fiber port and a twisted and an Ethernet or a, a twisted pair port on each of those. Type of transmitter and we set a device that transmits and receives signals. A transceiver, we have transmitters and receivers. A transceiver does both of those things. So these are the connectors that that this individual said that CompTIA wants you to know. The first is an RJ45 and we'll work, or excuse me, RJ11, and I don't have an RJ11. What does an RJ11 connect? Phone. They have a question and it's kind of odd and it shows up in the question bank and I don't remember, you're going to have to take the test on us. What's the maximum number of wires that can go into an RJ11? It's a trick question. It's got a slot for six. They make it with four, but it's got a slot. It's got slots for six. The standard allows for six wires in an RJ11. Huh? They don't ever use it. It's just that the standard allow the standard allows for it. It's very similar to these things to the next one, which is the and this this one you can see it's got one, two, three, four, five, six. It's got four wires six slots. And I've seen, I think when I went through the test bank there were probably four RJ11 and I kept picking that one and it was wrong and it finally gets up and it says how many is maximum or something like that, maximum number of wires that can go into it and it's six. The standard does call for six. But typically we're going to use two, two pair four wires for the telephone. And telephone actually only uses two wires, doesn't it? The other two are for the second phone line. Look very similar. They're smaller than the RJ45, which is the next one here. And we will do these things. The color code, we'll, we'll go through the color code. This is the, when we talk about the standards, this is the TEIA TIA568B standard, orange and white, orange, green and white, blue, blue and white, green, brown and white, brown. That one is one. If you're going to use one, this is it. This is the one that's supposed to be the current standard. The A standard is supposed to be defunct, although apparently the government requires the A standard to get to the C standard, which is a new one. That, that And the C standard allows you to make like cross connects for uh, uh, Cat 6E and Cat 7 type wires because you have to go more than the what we typically are going to use in this thing is two pair, four wires until you get to the higher standards and you start using more and more and more wires. The picture of the of the connectors that are in the Moodle when you see the cross connect 
uh, cables, it, it shows the browns being crossed. You have to do that in order to support the CAT6 standard. So RJ45 has eight wires, four pair. I'll pass these around. We're going to make Stephanie look at all these things. I've got no, it's not about, but I want you to, to look at these, touch these things because it's easier. I have found when I've taken cert tests, I don't know, it's easier to answer questions about things that you've done than things that you've read about yeah, and tried to memorize. Yeah. Sort of have a idea yeah. What, what they're asking about. So these things and the and the, the wires, we'll talk. We'll do these thing in a second. The RJ45. The next one is a BNC, and I looked this this up, and I've heard BNC different thing. British Naval Connector. You know, basically, you can make whatever you want these letters to stand for BNC. What it is is a twist off uh, connector. And that's what's used on these thin net connectors that have these T's on them. So they they twist off twist on, and you probably have seen these before and other things, but the B and C connectors are coax connectors, lots of different pictures here of those things. The next one is a fiber SC subscriber connector. They've got different names in the book. There are several, I only just picked one, there are several names that you can use for these things. An SC connector is one of these, and these actually have covers on. Feel free to take them off, but if, when you get done, just if you would put the cover back on. These just push in. So this is an S SC connector, is a square connector, and that's one of the ones I said call it a square connector. And you can you can feel this thing that if this goes back and forth on it. <clears throat> one of the questions <clears throat> I don't know that it's on the test, but it's in the test bank is <clears throat> which fiber connector would you use and not twist the connector? That would be the SC. The other one that they talk about is the ST or the straight tip. <clears throat> That's one of these. It does have a twist. You twist it to make it connect. So an ST straight tip's got a tip on it. An SC is a, kind of a square connector. The next one here I don't have, which is an LC. <clears throat> an LC is another fiber connector, little connector, loosened connector. It has two fibers going to it. When you connect fiber to a computer, to a switch, to an anything, you have to have two fibers. When we do these, when we talk about the, the, the these wires, the uh, twisted pair, we only need one twist, one set of wires to connect computer. We plug it in one, plug it in the other. Remember we've got eight wires in here. Typically we're using four. When we have a piece of fiber, a piece of fiber, you can have a grand total of one signal. Since we have a transceiver, a transmitter receiver, it'd be nice if we could transmit and receive. In order to do that you got to have two pieces of fiber. This one makes it a little more convenient, some more straight tips, but as you as you look at these things, it's kind of like this makes it easier to do. The last one here is RS-232. The RS-232 is is a uh, serial connector. There are, don't worry about them, there are a number of sizes and number of pins for the serial connectors. And what the guy that I got this from said that's it's mostly a Cisco standard. Cisco does use it a lot, although we use it on computers. One of the things that have caused some issues with Cisco users lately is they've taken serial ports off computers. You have to have an adapter. You have to get a, a, a USB to serial adapter in order to connect to the console port of your router because it's on RS-232, it's a serial standard. You've got to be able to connect through a serial port of some type to the router. So those are the, those are the 
connectors that this individual who I don't know said this is what he supposedly is taking the test and it's an endorsed course. These are the ones that CompTIA wants you to know. I won't guarantee that, but that's what he said. And that's typically what you're going to see, about what you're going to see in the book, I think. I think I do recall from the ST and SC. ST on, even on A+, plus, right? Yeah. ST and SC are about as far as they typically go on these things. We'll do one more topic, and then we'll let you work on homework let Stephanie get all these definitions typed up here. Let's see if we can come up with good definitions for these things because again there, th this is this this chapter really is a lot about terminology. That's why I was thinking yeah. all the yeah. more. Noise immunity, sometimes the media are more susceptible to noise than others. Fiber, obviously fiber is the least susceptible and as far as attenuation, you can attenuate the signal much more than you can in copper because there's no noise. There's no noise to it. There's no electromagnetic interference. Installing cabling away from powerful electromagnetic forces, we've kind of at least implied that, may need to use metal conduit to contain the cabling. When you install the cabling, one of the other things that you don't want to do that I see people do sometimes is run your network cable in the same conduit as your power cable. That will help out a lot. Hey, people do stuff. People take shortcuts. They run it right out the same one. Run it right out the same one, yep. They have, we had one that I think that's kind of, I think they took it off, but what they had done is the, the is accidentally the uh, network cable had gotten in parallel with one of the power cables on one of these desks. And it was, well, I have a lot of trouble logging in. Why well, have a lot of trouble logging in? I don't remember. It was one of these through here. Finally started looking at it and said, well, maybe it's the, maybe it's the way that the uh, cable's running. But be careful about those things. It's easy to do because, hey, we've got this conduit. We're going to use the conduit. Yes. When we got over to uh, Kuwait, we had to completely rewire our talks because they had run the phone cables, the internet cables, and the power cords all to the same one. <coughs> so you would go exactly nowhere, wouldn't you? But all the things we talked about, EMI. Be careful of those things. People do it. I mean, you just and these are these are guys supposed to know what they're doing, right? Supposed to know what they're doing. I didn't say that, but supposed to know what they're doing. The unit ahead of us never caught it. Yeah. And they couldn't figure out why they couldn't call home. Possible to use anti-noise algorithms in these things. Fiber. This is just a picture of fiber. This this shows. The buffer, the jumper, and, and these, these things are actually pretty well protected typically. This one has a number of different fibers in it, and this one, and there are lots of pictures of them, has a sheath, and this is usually a Teflon sort of a cushioning material, and we have multiple fibers in these things. When you run it from room to room, you want as many fibers as possible. Obviously, if we were going from here to the knock with the individual machines, or if we were going from one of these rows to the switch, we would want to we would want to bring a piece of fiber up that had as many fibers as we needed to each row and run that back collectively to the uh, to the knock to the uh, to the switch. I said I would quit here, so let me quit here for the night because you're probably tired of listening. <laughs>